I'm a big fan of horror movies and always have been. I grew up in the 1980s, when horror movies were a lot better and more hardcore than they are nowadays, at least to me. I'm not saying you don't get an occasional good one nowadays, but they're not really anywhere near as fun as they used to be. There was a lot more gore and killing and not as much CGI, just a lot of old school horror and practical effects. A lot of those movies were really gritty as well, not the PG-13 sort of horror you see nowadays. On the weekends, I would normally rent out several movies. Many of them at the time were direct-to-video releases, and I'd have a weekend night marathon to myself. Anyone who grew up on horror and video stores in the 80s has to have fond memories of seeing boxes for movies. You know, Sleepaway Camp, Evil Dead 2, Return to Horror High... Well, I grabbed up mine and hunkered down in my basement bedroom to watch the movies. My family wasn't really into these sorts of films like I was. It didn't really matter to me, though. I was fine to watch all this stuff completely on my own. When I was about 16 years old, I rented out another batch of movies to watch. I even remember exactly which ones. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which surprisingly somehow I'd never seen up to that point. The Hills Have Eyes, and some cheap indie film called Dead Time Stories. None of them seemed tremendously scary to me, I guess, but that wasn't really the point of all this. I had a pretty wild imagination, and I liked to force myself to get scared pretty easily. By the time I'd finished watching, it was already well past 2am. I hadn't had anything to eat in a while, so I went up into the main house and made myself something to snack on. I was actually upstairs for about 40 minutes. We weren't allowed to eat in our bedrooms. I had been okay walking around the house upstairs for the most part, but when I went back down to the basement to go to bed, I actually found myself getting quite a bit apprehensive. I couldn't see into the basement at all until I was already halfway down the steps, so I was extremely nervous walking down them. The lights were off at the bottom, so I slowly took each step one at a time feeling like punching myself for forgetting to turn the light on. Before I got to four steps from the bottom, I just jumped the rest of the way down and flipped on the light as quickly as possible. It was kind of weird, and I can't explain to this day why I felt that way, but for some reason, I was really freaked out. I assumed the movies were probably just sticking with me afterwards. I looked over at the clock on my nightstand and saw it was 3 a.m. now. I started wondering if maybe I should just turn out the light and run over to my bed to go to sleep. The faster I did, the quicker morning would come after all. I would feel silly for being scared. For some reason, I just couldn't bring myself to turn the light out though. Each time I tried, I would hesitate, and I decided that it was going to be light in two and a half hours anyway. Maybe I should just leave the lights on and watch a comedy movie to calm myself down. Yeah, that was the better option. I turned on the lamp that was sitting on my nightstand and turned off the overhead lights. At this point, only the area around my bed was illuminated. I didn't have many comedies. I popped in an extremely bad film I had seen many times, the pirate movie. As I watched, my eyes kept on shifting toward the windows. I had those basement windows, where a hole was dug into the ground so the basement could get some light. I also glanced over to the closet. I had never been this nervous before after some simple movies. I couldn't figure out exactly why I was so scared. About halfway through, close to 4am, something suddenly caught my eye. I turned over to that window. I'm not sure exactly why I hadn't noticed it before, but now I saw the window was actually slightly open. I wondered if that was why I'd felt so paranoid. Perhaps I knew it was open on a subconscious level. I got up out of my bed and went over to close it. About halfway from the bed to the window, though, suddenly I heard a shuffling sound coming from my closet. There was no doubt. Someone was in there. I forgot about that window and took off out of the basement, screaming for my parents to get up and call the police. My dad grabbed his gun and went down to the basement. They caught the guy mid-act, trying to pull himself up and out the window. What we heard from the man was what he told the police. He broke into the basement around the time I was out getting myself that snack. He didn't think anyone was in there, and I'd caught him by surprise when I came back down. I hadn't seen him because it was so dark, 
so he hid in the closet real quick. I'd been going down the stairs so slowly that he had ample time to do this. For that one hour I was watching that movie in the dark, the man was in the closet, watching me through the slits and the door and waiting for me to fall asleep. Fortunately for me, he wasn't going to come out of that closet until I went to bed. Who knows what he would have done to me if I had. Still though, there's something really unsettling about knowing someone is watching you from inside your own home and knowing that he was waiting for me to go to sleep the whole time. I used to go to this grindhouse theater in Los Angeles when I was a young teenager. I still get nostalgic for it, even though it really wasn't that nice of a place. It was actually in quite a bad part of town. It wasn't kept up very well either, and attracted a pretty low class of clientele. I figure I can say that without seeming prejudiced because I myself was a member of that low class clientele. From about age 13 onward, I would go and spend a day there. I missed that about those theaters. For less than five bucks, I could go there around noon, sit in a theater, and watch a bunch of really bad movies all day long. In fact, that became my normal weekend routine for several years on. When I was 15, though, I stopped going to that grindhouse. I had a pretty bad experience there. On this particular day, I can't really tell you what movie I was watching. They all kind of ran together at some point. I remember the experience much more than the movie anyway. Anyway, I was watching the movie and I was actually one of the only few people there. In the middle of the movie though, a group of five guys walked into the theater. Normally, I wouldn't have paid them any attention, except they all came right to where I was sitting and sat all around me. And that really irritated me because the theater was practically empty. My irritation was only going to get worse. These guys began talking really loud throughout the movie and were pretty vulgar and not shy about it either. They kept talking back to the screen and laughing at the most inappropriate moments. I was beginning to get really aggravated, although I knew there wasn't much, if anything, I could do about it. Remember, this was kind of a run-down grindhouse theater, so they didn't have an usher. There was a guy working tickets and another guy working the snack counter, but that was about all the personnel there. I tried to drown out the men and watch the movie, only it started to get worse. The guy behind me started to kick the back of my chair, not just lightly tapping it, full on kicking it with all his might. These guys were obviously trying to get me to yell at them or get irritated, and I was definitely getting irritated. Once again, I tried my best to ignore it, but they started harassing me so much I just couldn't anymore. I decided to get up and leave. These were five guys much older than me, at least in their late 20s, and I was one 15-year-old. It would have been stupid for me to start a fight all on my own. As I was leaving, they started making chicken sounds at me, of course, and calling me names. I did my best to shrug it off. It wasn't easy, but I did leave with my head held high. I was really upset. Once I left, I would have to pay again to go back into the theater and watch more movies. That was assuming they wouldn't be there all day, too. I decided it was still early enough for me to stick around a bit. I had the idea to kind of wait it out in the bathroom stall for a while until they left. Yeah, I know how that sounds, but I really didn't want to leave and have to spend more money. It was only about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I wanted to do more that day. Surely the guys had had their fun. When they realized I'd left, they would eventually leave too, and I could go back in safe and sound. After I had been sitting there for quite a while, though, I heard the door open. I cringed, thinking that it might have been the guys who were sitting around me. I realized how stupid I was, and I probably should have just left the damn theater. I felt a bit calmer when I realized it was just one person, not five. That calmness did not last very long, though. Whoever this was, was walking very slowly, taking deliberate steps right up to me. I pulled my feet up further to hide myself in the stall. The slow steps continued, and by this point I could see the feet of the person on the other side of the door. He walked right over and stopped right in front of it. He didn't try to open the door, but he did begin to tap on it. I emphasize it was a tapping and not a knocking, because he was using some sort of object to do it. 
my anxiety was peaking, and I cursed myself again for not just leaving. He took the object and slid it in between the space and the door. I almost had a heart attack. It was a switchblade. I felt tears begin to form in my eyes. I was convinced this person was going to kill me. I couldn't do anything except remain on the toilet seat, practically crying to myself. The man took the knife and slid it up and down in the space before pulling it out. I could hear him doing something, but I wasn't sure what it was. It sounded like he was fumbling around. He then threw something over the stall onto me and ran out of the bathroom. I grabbed the object in surprise, then dropped it to the ground in terror when I realized it was a decapitated crow's head. Scared for my life, I got up and opened the stall. As I did, I noticed he had written something on the stall door in what I figured was the blood of that crow. It was my first name. Somehow, that guy knew my name. I was out of that place, and I didn't care that there was no usher in the building. I went right to the ticket counter and told them what happened. And they called the cops. Actually, they were very nice and let me into the ticket booth as I waited for the cops to show up. All five guys were long gone by that point, though the cop was nice enough to give me a ride home. I have no idea how that guy knew my name. All I know is that I never saw any of those guys again and I never went back to that grindhouse either. I've seen a few arcades around nowadays, but not nearly as many as they had back when I was growing up. The ones they have now were very different as well. Of course, the games are much more advanced, but that's not all that I mean. Maybe I'm just getting old. I don't know, but there's something about those old 80s style arcades that just fills me with a wonderful sense of nostalgia. I remember when standing around watching others play Pac-Man was a big deal. I never thought we would reach a time period where any video game was bigger than Pac-Man was. Now though, he's pretty much just an afterthought. I guess one of the better things about the arcades of today is that they tend to be in better parts of town and nicer buildings as well. The few I see are, at least in places like Gamesworks, all in areas that seem to be very low crime and are kept very clean and well maintained. In the late 70s and early 80s, a lot of people may not remember this, but arcades were really looked down upon by most people. Before Pac-Man was released, kids didn't even really hang out at arcades. They attracted an older group, smoking, lots of drinking, very prominent dark stuff in arcades. Most people credit Pac-Man with being the game that brought children in, but even after Pac-Man, they didn't automatically become the nicest and safest places to be. I mention Pac-Man a lot because it has some relevance to my story. The game Pac-Land came out around 1984, and I was obsessed with wanting to play it. It basically just involved Pac-Man walking to the end of town, grabbing these magic boots, then running back to the beginning of the board one of the earliest side-scrolling games. The only problem was that in the arcade I went to, I never really got a chance to play. I was 11 years old at the time, and that game always had a line of people waiting for it. An 11-year-old would never be able to get to the front of the line. My big break came, though, when Gauntlet was released in 1985. That game became the big video game of that arcade, freeing up most of the other machines in the place. I was 12 at this time, and I often headed down to the arcade on weekends by myself. My parents didn't really care. They didn't take any interest in what I did. The arcade I'd go to was in a crappy part of town right next to a 7-Eleven that had a pretty bad reputation as a gang hangout. The building itself was very dirty and was always loud due to the combination of noise from the games and the fact they were always playing extremely loud rock music. On this particular day, I got into the arcade when I noticed a large amount of people hanging out by the gauntlet machine. There were other people scattered throughout, but not many. Gauntlet was a bit revolutionary for the time, since four people could play simultaneously. I became very excited. My expectations were that I would finally be able to play Pac-Land. Finally, I went to the part of the arcade where the game was and was astounded to find it being played by only one person, an older teenager. Not to my surprise, really. The arcade had a rule that if you wanted to play a game after someone, you go up to the game and place a quarter upon it. That would save the game for you for the next turn. 
Excitedly, I ran up, took out my quarter, and put it down on the game. The guy playing it, momentarily distracted, turned and gave me a dirty look. I didn't really care because I was finally going to get to play this game. When he died though, the guy didn't let me take my turn. In fact, he took my quarter, slid it into the game, and began playing. I tried to protest in anger, but the guy just ignored me. I was so pissed off, but I couldn't do anything on my own. I went to speak with the guy at the counter, who exchanged dollars for quarters. I told him what happened. He came over to the Pac-Man game and confronted the guy. Like he had done with me, the teenager basically ignored the worker at first. The worker got annoyed with the guy for ignoring him, more than what he'd done to me. He told the guy he had to return my quarter to me. The teenager just ignored him again. The worker then put his hand on the guy's shoulder. The guy playing the game did not like that at all. He turned around and punched the worker right in the face. It only took a couple of moments before another guy who worked there, some sort of security or bouncer type, came over and threw the guy from the arcade. I smiled at him smugly as he was dragged out. As he was leaving, he threatened to find me and attack me. I finally got to play Pac-Land though, so I didn't care. I not only got to play it, but I played it a lot. So much that I completely lost track of time. It was already dark before I realized it. I still had to get home, so I left the arcade. Walking home, I started to hear footsteps not far behind me. It wasn't too weird of a thing, really. It was a pretty big neighborhood. As I made several turns onto different blocks, though, they kept following me. Feeling a bit apprehensive, I tried to glance behind me to see who it was. I'm sure you're not surprised to be told it was that teenager I'd pissed off earlier. He looked to be carrying what looked like the leg of a coffee table. Scared, I began to run, and I heard him chasing behind me. I cursed myself over and over for looking back, and stupidly did so again. My foot got caught on an uneven crack between the sidewalk blocks, and I fell face first onto the ground. I didn't realize in the moment, but the impact broke my nose. I did know right away that my face was covered in blood. When I turned up, I noticed the man coming closer to me. I saw it actually was a coffee table leg, with one long screw pointing out of the end. As he came closer, he said something I'll never forget. You want to go to Pac-Land? I'll send you to Pac-Land. He wasn't upon me yet, so I went for broke. I jumped up and ran to the nearest house, pounding on the door, yelling and screaming bloody murder. I didn't even know whose house it was, but I didn't care. And the people who lived there answered the door immediately, and fortunately for me, ran the teenager off. And the people in that house were also kind enough to call my parents, who took me to the emergency room and forbade me from ever going to the arcade again. I was very upset, of course, but they did buy me a click vision and the very first game they got me was Pac-Land, so I was satisfied. A few years ago, I was working at a pizza chain in my hometown as a driver. I was 27, but made damn good money delivering. I'd worked at a few other places, both local and chain in the years before, and still work as a dasher on occasion, even after this happened. Now I choose to deliver in much safer areas though, for this exact reason. I got luckier than I could ever imagine. One night I was working and I had a double, two deliveries to take. Both were cash orders. I had $12 left in my bank, which drivers are given to use as change for cash orders, so you don't have to have a ton of cash on you at all times. The first order went smoothly. The guy gave me $50 for a $35 order, so I was excited about the nice tip. I drove to the second delivery. It was an apartment complex with multiple buildings. I had delivered there before, in fact. The sun was about to set, but it was still very light out. The chain I worked at had us drive company cars with a logo on them, all white sedans. I grabbed the order and went to the door of the apartment building. A young guy came out. A much bigger older guy was outside smoking a cigarette. The big guy went inside as the smaller guy came out. He looked around nervously and asked how much he owed me. The way he was looking around just made me very nervous too. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. I told him the amount, and he said that wasn't what he was told on the phone. Immediately, something felt wrong. I felt someone else walk out behind me from the door, as the first young guy looked around down the parking lot, craning his neck as if he was looking for someone. I told him the amount again, 
and broke down the order for him trying to keep calm. Then the first guy held a gun right to my temple. I felt a poke on my spine. Two gunmen. I couldn't speak. Words wouldn't form no matter how hard I tried. Give me your money and keys now, the first guy growled. I fumbled immediately for the keys. I gave him my bank but hadn't realized the 50 was mixed in. I gave him the keys trying my best to remain calm. Another guy came from my left. He had poofy hair and was around the same age as the first kid. The one behind me I hadn't seen yet. The big haired kid grabbed the pizza bag and ran off and hid. The first one searched the company car. Luckily I had left my wallet in my personal car. I saw him grab my cell phone. That's when the panic began to set in. I had pictures on that phone that I hadn't backed up of my then five year old son who's absolutely my world. Please, please don't take that. I have pictures of my son who died on there. It's all I have of him, please. I lied. My son was very much alive. The kid behind me spoke softly. Trust me, just listen to him. You'll get it back undamaged. I don't want to be here either. I could tell he'd been crying by how his voice sounded. My car began pulling in, and the three boys took off to the other end of the complex in a full sprint. Before the one behind me ran, he dropped the gun right in front of me. Standard issue 9mm silver and black. Safety off. Looked real enough to me. He picked it back up and ran off with the others. The car that pulled in saw me. A woman and her kid it seemed. Panic set in as I realized they could easily come back and do way worse to me and the sky was starting to get dark. I had collapsed. They had taken the company car keys, $72, the pizza and my phone. The woman ran up to me and asked if I was alright. She took me into her apartment in the next building over and locked the door. I was shaking so hard I couldn't even hold her phone to talk to 911 as she sat down her kid. Her boyfriend, I assumed, helped me call. I spoke to the operator and told them everything. I'm colorblind. Thankfully, these guys were all wearing black and white clothes. I had a full description of two of them. The poor woman who helped me was going to be late for work but she stayed until I was off the phone and the cops had shown up. Man, she was harsh and blunt with the operator. I'll never forget this woman's utter kindness to me, though, and her boyfriend's as well. The cops showed up and contacted my store. My manager brought out the spare keys for me to drive the car back. After dealing with the cops, I drove back and was greeted by crying and beyond worried co-workers. All of them were terrified I'd been killed or something. It meant a lot to me to see how much they cared. I told them I was fine. I filed the proper paperwork and the $72 was written off as a loss to the store. Thank God because I had worked other stores that make you pay back the money out of pocket if you get robbed to prevent drivers from stealing. The owner told me to take the rest of the night off and take care of myself. He gave me a hug as well. Guy was one of the best bosses I ever had. What I didn't know yet was that I was in for a much longer night still. I called my best friend before I left the store from the store phone and asked where he was. We usually met up for drinks after work and he was around the corner at a bar. I met up with him. His dad was a District 4 cop in my city at the time, the same district this happened in. He told me his dad had given him a heads up and he had two shots waiting for me to calm my nerves. We had begun playing pool when his dad called his cell phone and asked if I was with him yet. He said yeah and handed me the phone. His dad asked if I could come down to the station. I was honest and told him I'd had some to drink, so he sent out a squad car to get me. We got down to the station and they had the suspects in custody. All I needed was to ID them. Three boys and a driver. They'd been caught less than 20 minutes after the robbery speeding. The bolo had already gone out and they matched the description perfectly. They used the money to buy weed and gas and took off. They had at least 15 stolen cell phones on them. The order had been placed on a stolen phone. My phone was in the mix in a box. The police told me to grab my phone only and I did so. They asked me to unlock it. It had fingerprint verification so that was easy enough. I noticed that 9 of the 10 tries to unlock it had already been used before my phone would completely reset. It unlocked right away. I told the police every detail yet again, although my parental instincts kicked in. I told them the guy behind me quite obviously had been bullied into this and to show that guy some mercy, the only guy in a white shirt. The police told me he was the only one that was talking. The other three denied involvement. And that's when I found out about the fourth guy, the driver. We found out later he was completely unaware of anything and just happened to be picking up his friends. He was never charged. 
The boy who was behind me and the one who grabbed the pizza were 15 and 16 and got six months of house arrest. The only reason the one behind me got off easy, despite having the gun to my back, was because I asked them to go easy on him. He was the only one that was confessing as well. Makes sense since he even said the other guy wouldn't have the phone for long. He was planning on going to the cops had they not been caught in the first place. The other guy, the first kid who put the gun to my temple, it was his 18th birthday, so he got the full book thrown at him. In the courtroom, he tried to make fun of me and was laughing at me. Seeing him made me panic. The judge scolded him for his behavior, and he just grinned and glared at me like the Joker. All I could see was pure evil. I know that kid will commit more crimes. No doubt eventually he'll end someone's life. You could see how cold he was just by looking into his eyes. I never want to see that again. I asked to have my name stricken from the records, and asked to remain anonymous in case he ever got out. I'm glad I did, because today I got a letter from the state, and he's being released in February. The court only had my old address, and my mom didn't think the letter was important. I missed the deadline to protest his release for probation. The plea deal was for eight years, but it's only been four, getting out early due to overcrowding. Not good behavior, just overcrowding. This coming February. This is kind of an old story. It happened back in the late 1970s, as will be revealed by a few things that come up within. I just thought I should mention that so no one wonders why I didn't call on my cell phone or something like that. Back then, the closest thing most people had to a cell phone was on the wall of a building, and you had to feed quarters to it to even use it. When I was 16, I didn't really have a lot of friends. I spent a lot of my time walking around town in the surrounding area. There was an old train yard that I'd like to explore. It was especially nice in the fall when it would be cool outside. I'd throw on my jacket and just go out and explore and have fun. It was fall of 1978 that I had gotten up the courage to explore an old abandoned hospital just on the outskirts of town. It wasn't like a sanitarium or anything crazy like that, at least not to my knowledge. It was just an old hospital that closed down in the 60s sometime. It was fenced and gated off, of course, and they had plenty of no trespassing signs on it, but it wasn't really a challenge to get inside. The only thing that was a challenge was gathering up the nerve to go ahead and do it. I had no idea what the police would have done if they caught me. If anything, I finally convinced myself to do it when I told myself it made no sense the police would be hanging around there anyway. I mean, why would they? I got over the gate easily and snuck in. The first time, I actually didn't go into the hospital itself. I just kinda explored the grounds. Although I had overcome my nerves regarding entering the property, I hadn't overcome them in regards to breaking into the building itself. There was a big old fountain right up front, covered in moss and other green gunk. I tossed some rocks into it while waiting around. Making my way around the back, I discovered an old park area. There were various things like slides and swing sets left lying around. I tried to swing on one of the swings, fell and hurt my ass of course. After poking around a little more I left. About a week later I came back. I decided I was going to try and find a way inside. It was boarded up pretty damn tight and many of the windows had bars on them as well. I wasn't able to break in this initial time so I just left again. The following week though, I came back with some tools to aid me. I was determined to get into that hospital somehow. I was able to, after much effort and various cuts on my hands, to pry off some of the bars covering one of the windows. I then used a hammer to break it open and smash all the glass off. I was finally able to slide in. Being inside the hospital was a very creepy experience. It was of course very dark in many places and I had to carry a flashlight around with me. The higher floors, which I also visited as well, were not as dark though. That part was actually pretty well lit. Because the floors and stairs were all still solid, I was able to find my way around quite easily and safely. I explored a lot of the old rooms. To my surprise, many of them still had old and really rusted worn out equipment. Nothing like needles or anything like that. With various wheelchairs, gurneys, I was pretty excited. 
At one point, I went ahead and tried to ride a wheelchair down a wheelchair ramp. It didn't work out so well. The wheel got caught on some debris and I was propelled forward and onto the floor of the ramp, scuffing myself up quite badly. It was while I was lying there on the ramp that I could have sworn that I heard someone laughing. It immediately sent a chill down my spine. Although I couldn't be sure, I figured it was better to get out as quickly as possible. I walked back to the room that had the window I had broken, feeling like I was being watched the entire time. I rushed out, constantly looking behind me. I almost expected someone to grab my leg from behind while I was going through the window, but nobody did. I made it off the grounds and swore to myself I would not go back there ever. As you can imagine, that promise didn't exactly last very long. I came back a scant six weeks later. My experience had done enough to scare me into not coming back for a while, but not permanently. I convinced myself I had just imagined the laughing, and I'd simply psyched myself out. I had been around most of the hospital that day, after all, and had not seen any indication that someone else might have possibly been there. There was no way anyone could have gotten into the building anyway. It had taken me forever, and I didn't see any other exposed entrances or anything. I got back in through my regular window and began to explore other parts of the building. I had completely gotten over my apprehension at this point. It was when I walked into what I assumed to be an operating room, because there was an operating table there, that I got the chill of my life. Plastered all over the walls were hundreds of Polaroid pictures. The vast majority were people I'd never seen before, but on one of the opposite walls, there were at least 20 of me. I saw pictures of me out by the fountain, me tossing a rock into it, me on my ass when I fell off the swing. I saw a picture of me on the ramp when I'd fallen off the wheelchair. The pictures were not of great quality, obviously taken without flashes while hiding, but I could make out they were definitely of me. I've never before nor since been as freaked out as I was in that moment. I'll just admit it. I wasn't freaked out. I was scared shitless. I turned and surveyed the hallway. I made my way back to my entrance window. Every step was a nightmare. Walking by every door, I expected someone to grab me and pull me in. Every sound caused me to jump out of my skin, and by the time I made it to the exit, I can admit I was nearly in tears out of pure terror. The process of going out the window was terrible too. I had to keep looking behind me. I made it out and made it over the fence finally, and there came the scariest part. I just made it over the fence, when I got a sudden feeling and looked back at the hospital. There was a person standing right next to the fountain, looking at me. He had a Polaroid camera in his hands, and he snapped my picture. Did I tell my parents? No, of course not. Did I call the police? What good would that have done? I was trespassing. As far as I know, the guy might have owned the place, or perhaps been the groundskeeper or something. I had no proof he was an intruder. I also would have had to admit to both my parents and the police that I had broken the law by trespassing and shattering a window, so in my mind I couldn't tell anybody. My only solace was there was no way this man could have known who I was, or where I lived. Afterwards, I never went back to that hospital, just to be safe. Now this story doesn't have any surprise twists in it. It doesn't have any people who are secretly watching me or anything like that. But it was pretty damn terrifying all on its own. My brother happens to work in a morgue, you see. He would never bring it up in conversation and insisted there was nothing scary about working there. I always told people where he worked and they'd get real excited assuming he had some scary stories to tell. But everything he talked about was very mundane and always boring. He always insisted nothing scary ever happened in a morgue. One weekend, I decided to make something scary happen. I snuck into it, and no, other people are not supposed to go in there, but I still did. It wasn't even that difficult to do, honestly. I knew when my brother was working, and I knew when he was going to be out for lunch for at least an hour. You ever see those movies where people eat in morgues? Gross. I knew my bro never did that. My ingenious idea was to go into one of the cabinets and slide myself on top of one of the corpses and close it. Gross, right? I thought it would be fine because the corpse was covered in a very heavy apron of some sort. When it opened, I would scream at my brother and make him mess his pants. 
it would be worth it to be that close to a dead body for just a little while. It's not like they're that different from a live person, just very still. They don't have secret germs or cooties or anything like that. I won't lie, it wasn't easy to cram myself inside. There wasn't a whole lot of extra room, and closing myself in was difficult as hell. Pushing the platform back in and getting the cabinet door shut from the inside, almost impossible. Took me so long, I assumed my brother or someone else would make it back before I was done. But they didn't. I closed myself in and waited for the moment I was going to scare the hell out of my bro. I waited. I heard him come in and I prepared myself. But he didn't open the cabinet. I could hear him moving around, working, but he didn't open it. Actually, I didn't hear him open any cabinets. He was definitely moving around there, though. I figured a good joke was worth a little wait. Hell, I'd already been lying there for a little while. Was it going to hurt me to lay there much longer? So I laid there and waited and waited. Must have been two hours or something in my mind at least. Then I suddenly felt something. The corpse I was laying on moved its arm. I didn't even care about my joke anymore. At that point, I began screaming and banging on the damn walls of the cabinet. It didn't take long before my brother opened it up, obviously very startled. I jumped out immediately and began brushing myself off. I don't know why I did that. It was like a reflex or something. My brother was both angry and confused. I kept yelling that the body was alive or something, and he wasn't understanding me. When I calmed down, I explained it better, and he laughed at me. He laughed at me when I was supposed to be the one playing a joke on him. He then explained to me that the smaller muscles of a dead body, although extremely rarely, can on occasion move by themselves. He told me I should feel very fortunate, because in his entire career, he had only ever seen that happen one time. I'd experienced a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Yeah, why couldn't I have one pick three or something? That's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. No, I had to hide on a dead body and feel it move by itself. At least my brother finally had an interesting morgue story to tell now, though. He always tells the story about how his dumbass brother nearly crapped his pants laying on top of a corpse that just so happened to move. This is a story that happened when I was in the hospital about 15 years ago. Well, I wasn't in the hospital myself. I was at the hospital a lot, though, visiting my boyfriend. Yes, I am gay, and this is very important to the story. I'm sure it had a lot to do with what happened. My boyfriend at the time had been in a head-on collision. I'll never forget when I heard about it. My body went numb, and I even blacked out for a moment. Seeing him in the ICU in a coma was just so bizarre. It was almost like he wasn't even my boyfriend. Like whatever made him Jamie was just gone. I'm not even sure if I'm explaining it correctly. It was just so odd to see him like this. I was allowed to spend time with him in the ICU because I was his medical proxy. His family was severely homophobic and we worried that something like this might happen. He knew his family would never let me in to see him. So he'd filled out the paperwork and our attorney filed it. It was established that I had full control over the situation. I, in fact, could even keep his family from seeing him if I wanted to. I'm not that kind of person, though, so his family was free to visit as often as they wanted, as long as I was made aware of the situation. My control over the matter did not sit well with his mom, of course. Jamie and his mom had never gotten along anyway. She would raise hell with the doctors about how Jamie was her son, and I was just the slur boyfriend. Yes, she used the term. I was not a true member of the family. They had better get her consent, not mine. Update her first on everything. At first, this was barely an inconvenience. I was willing to put up with it. I thought Jamie would have liked his mom to be there. Eventually, though, the doctors told me that her fighting with them so much in front of Jamie, no less was a huge distraction to them, and the stress was affecting Jamie negatively. I tried to talk to her, but there's no talking to that woman. I tried to be nice and let her know I wanted her to be able to see her son. He had signed me in as his medical proxy. I was legally in control of the situation, and that was not going to change no matter how much she complained. She needed to quit arguing with the doctors and let them do their job. Oh yeah? Well, why don't you just get AIDS and die, you stupid... 
Jamie's mom sneered at me and called me a slur. That was it. I had been patient. I had been nice way beyond the expectations of anyone who would have been in my situation. I had her removed immediately. It was terrible. She yelled and screamed and called me and the doctors all sorts of slurs. Carried on about how I was going to hell, converting her son and making him into a... She was removed by security, actually the police. Two nights later, I was leaving the hospital, heading for the hotel I was staying at. All of a sudden, I noticed some guy who had been sitting on the couch in the waiting area almost all day get up to follow me. He was big and dressed all in camouflage. He walked out behind me and into the parking garage. I was worried it might be a friend of Jamie's mom. I was confident, though, he would at least not try to do anything to me in the hospital. There were cameras and police officers all around, after all. I made it to my car and got in. Didn't take long at all before a pickup truck pulled up behind me as I was leaving the garage. Not only was it sitting awfully high, but the truck had its high beams on, too. Annoying as hell. I left the parking garage and turned left. The truck followed me. At first, I thought it was nothing to worry about. He had to turn left or right anyway, so it was a 50-50 chance. When I made it to a red light, I flipped on my turn signal. Immediately, the truck turned on the same signal. I tried to put it out of my head, until the exact same thing happened in the next light. And again, and again, I debated back and forth in my head whether this was just being made up, or if this guy was really following me. I turned on my right signal when I was supposed to make a left turn. The truck turned on their signal as well. I turned left instead, though. The truck switched their signals and followed me. No doubt they were tailing me. I made a turn I didn't have to make, and they still turned with me. In fact, I went in a complete circle and they followed me the whole way. I was terrified. I didn't even live in this city. Jamie had been airlifted there, and that's why I was staying in a hotel. I didn't know anyone other than the people in the hospital. I also didn't know where the police station was. I had no idea what to do but to keep driving. It was very late, past midnight, so there were not a lot of places or parking lots I could pull into where I could get help. I mean, there were lots, but they were all empty. None of that mattered, though. When I was feeling most frantic, I came to another red light and stopped. The truck, instead of stopping, ran right into me. My car died immediately. I was startled and scared out of my mind. I'd been wearing my seatbelt, thankfully, and hadn't been injured. The pickup wasn't hurt as badly as my now stalled car. Thankfully for me, the fucker just drove off, though. I figured what happened is Jamie's mom must have had this guy ram into me in the hopes I would be hospitalized or something. Then she could control her son's medical situation. Maybe that's why the guy waited for me and followed me for so long, getting up the nerve to actually do it. Maybe he was going to attack me, but decided I wasn't going to get out of the car and figured ramming me was a good idea. Well, it wasn't for him. The man was caught. It was Jamie's mom's cousin, of course. He went to jail for a hidden run, as I couldn't prove it was premeditated. Yes, he had been following me, but I had no evidence. His mother swore up and down that she had nothing to do with it, but nobody believed her. Jamie cut her out of his life completely when he recovered. It's been 15 years and we haven't heard from her at all. It was Jamie's decision, not mine, and we're still happily together today. For context, this happened 20 years ago, just after Christmas. I had turned six about a month prior. My mom went out one day and left my then 16-year-old cousin to look after me and my two older siblings, a brother who was eight and my sister who was 11. My cousin decided to take us out to the city, which was 10 minutes from where we lived. We took the bus and walked around the city in incredibly unsafe neighborhoods, with basically another child responsible for us. After a few hours, we got tired and decided to go home. The city had a central area for the buses, not like a bus station, but like a perfectly huge square field with some plants and flowers and bushes. In this square field lining all four sides along the streets were many bus stops and benches. Basically, you could catch several different buses from that area going all over the county and city. Since it was just after Christmas, the bushes along the field were covered in Christmas lights still. As we waited for the bus to arrive, I began to wander away and admire the lights my cousin seemingly none the wiser. 
At some point, I heard a man call out from behind me and say hello. I looked up from the bush, only to see the man standing above it smiling down at me. Thinking back on it once I got older, it was quite clear the man was homeless, and from the look of his eyes, possibly on drugs. He had longish brown hair that was extremely wet, teeth that were black along the gums, and his clothes were incredibly dirty and torn. He had several jackets on as well. None of this really registered in my six-year-old brain, though. I just smiled back up and said hello. The man asked if I liked looking at these lights. I said yes, they were very pretty. He said this, and I'll never forget this exact sentence. Well, if you like Christmas lights, I've got some really cool lights at my house that you'll love. You want to come see them? I eagerly said yes. He reached down and took my hand in his. We started to walk away together. We were headed to the corner of the field where a few bigger buildings were. He said his apartment was just a couple blocks away. We were headed around the corner of the building when my arm jerked backward suddenly. I turned to see my sister pulling me away from the man. He didn't say a single word in response. He just instantly took off running. It took a few years for me to fully grasp the danger I was in. My sister and brother talked about what happened a lot and how scary it was. When I finally got a little older, I appreciated how terrifying it really was and how close I was to having my life change or possibly end forever. If I had rounded that city corner with the man, they never would have been able to find me in time. They wouldn't have even known where to start looking before we disappeared around that corner and deep into the city. It's something we still bring up sometimes to this very day. I'm usually a lurker, but this memory from a year ago popped into my head. I wanted to share because I was so shocked in the moment. I realize now just how scary the situation was. It was also super strange as well. This story is kind of hard to describe, but I'll try my best. I, 22 and female, was meeting my dad at a tire shop in an increased crime area of town. I can't exactly remember why we were going to a tire shop in particular. It was around noontime or so, though. My dad brought his chihuahua with him, so I took her on a walk around the tire shop while he consulted with the mechanics. The shop was about half a football field away from a busy street, with a big field in between the shop and that area. Otherwise, it was completely residential. I figured because of this, it was safe enough to walk the dog around in the field, after all, my dad and the mechanics were right there. I didn't realize the shop was fenced in and not facing the field. I guess because of it, it wasn't actually that safe for me, because nobody inside could actually see me. I was just walking the little dog around in this field, not particularly close to the busy street at all. All of a sudden, this beat-up old car with the windows rolled down started driving really slowly down this busy street. I could tell immediately the man inside was staring me down. The street was somewhat far away from me. The man eventually did drive past, so initially I thought, you know, whatever. Then though, a couple of seconds later, I see the car again going down the street. This time in the opposite direction. He was going really fast. He turned onto the side street where I was. I realized he was driving very, very fast. He gunned it right into the field where I was walking the dog. His car literally jumped over the curb, coming straight for me. It was so fast I was completely shocked. For no reason out of nowhere, this man was about to plow me down. What the fuck was happening? It was so quick that, in my confused shock, I completely hesitated. I was contemplating running away, but I also didn't want to turn my back to this car. Miraculously, I guess there was some sort of uneven ground or an unseen pothole. The guy's car, which had been coming straight for me, got stuck and a wheel started spinning. With his wheels down, I could now hear him cursing and shouting. I took this moment to scoop up my dog and run the hell out of there. The man opened his car door. He was about to get out, it seemed. I can't remember many descriptions about the man, other than that he was quite overweight. Again, because of the shock. I can't even recall his race or age range or anything. Right at that exact moment, a truck pulled up beside us with two youngish men inside. 
It seemed like a construction truck. They rolled down the windows and asked if the man was bothering me. The guy got spooked and bounced back into his car. He slammed his car in reverse and peeled out of whatever hole the car had been stuck in. He immediately took out of the field we were in without even bothering to check the street behind him and took off right away. The kind men who'd stopped saw all of this happen. It just happened so quickly. They were just as confused as I was. What was this dude's game plan? Why had he done this? Was he planning on kidnapping me in broad daylight with people around or did he just want to run me down? I'm not sure. I'm glad his car got stuck and I didn't have to find out. Obviously for me, this was very strange. I'm grateful his car got stuck and the guys who drove by stopped and were willing to check out the situation. We chatted for a moment after the guy left and were all very confused about what happened. I learned that at times I can be overconfident about my safety. After a handful of other strange, potentially dangerous encounters, I learned to always be alert. Bad things can happen at any time, anywhere. Every day, I walk home from school with my friend. She only lives a little bit away from me, so our routes line up perfectly. At the start of the school year, we noticed there was a man who would usually be looking out at us from his window whenever we walked home from school. We, of course, found that a little bit weird, but ultimately, we didn't think too much of it. A few months ago, after the heat of the summer died down a bit, he started to sit out on his porch every time we walked by instead. Usually, he would simply smile at us. Sometimes, I'd smile back, but usually I just ignored him. One day, as I was walking by his house, he happened to wave to me from where he was sitting. I stopped and waved back at him and told him to have a nice afternoon as I walked past. It felt a little bit strange. Instead of replying, he just gave me this really weird look. Eventually, I forgot about the whole thing, though. Once, when my mother was at work and I was alone at our house, I noticed the man walking past my house several times through my window. I felt very creeped out and uncomfortable. I considered talking to my parents about this just in case, but ultimately I convinced myself he wasn't doing anything wrong just walking by, so it didn't really matter. Yesterday, I walked home from school alone because I'd stayed behind with some other kids outside school for a few hours. We all had art club that day, and I didn't want to walk home just to have to come back fairly soon after. I had just bought myself a nice pair of wired headphones with money I'd been saving up for a long time since I don't have a job. I was playing them over one ear as I was walking home. On the walk home, there was a public lot with a stable on it that I liked to cut through to get into my yard as quick as I could, rather than walking around the property. Sometimes people liked to hang around it to meet up, but there wasn't anyone on it that I could see this day. As I rounded a corner on those stables, suddenly someone grabbed the back of my shirt. From the way they were grabbing me, I could see a part of their hand. I jerked forward, and they grabbed the top part of my headphones. They wrapped the wire around the bottom part of my neck and started to pull it backward. It got stuck for a moment. I remember feeling like if I couldn't get away from this, something very bad was about to happen to me. They were pulling so hard the wire snapped off. I took off running as fast as I could while screaming. Because of the snapping wire, they let go of my shirt. I hopped the half-length fence to our property and ran as fast as I could out onto the sidewalk in front of my house. I was worried I would take too long on the lock if they decided to follow me. By the time I actually got to the sidewalk, I was crying and felt like I was going to collapse because I was so scared. When I looked back over my shoulder, though, I couldn't see anyone there. I kept on running until I reached my friend's house, just in case whoever was there was still around when I got there. I was still in tears when I arrived. It took a bit to explain the situation because they couldn't understand what I was saying. I tried to call my mother, but she didn't answer the phone. My friend's mom called the police, and they came to check things out. There was nobody at the stables. They told me it was most likely some kid trying to mess around, but they escorted me home to where my mother was waiting for me anyway. I didn't tell them about the old man. I was worried they would think I was crazy, considering he had never actually technically done anything. There's something in my mind, though, that keeps telling me it was him who'd grabbed me at the stables. 
When I was walking home from school today, I brought a screwdriver with me just in case I needed to defend myself. I also had my friend with me too. My mother offered to pick me up from school, but I was worried that if I had shown how the encounter affected me, then the man might escalate things even more. I started to avoid the stables as well, and my friend made sure I made it to the door from then on. After that incident, too, I didn't see the guy out on his porch or through the window, so I'm still not fully sure if it's him or not. I feel terrible that my headphones broke, but I can't help but wonder what would have happened if they didn't. This was only a vague memory up until very recently, when I spoke to my dad about a recent dream I'd had. He confirmed that the dream was something that actually happened to me when I was younger. He filled in some of the more hazy details. These details I'm now going to share with you. It was 1995, and we'd just moved into an upper-class neighborhood in southwest Florida. Compared to my previous neighborhood full of professional adults and elderly couples, this neighborhood was a haven full of children my age. There was even a neighborhood park and a community pool, Things started to get real weird right from the get-go, though. My third night there, I began to hear this weird tapping on my window. Being as my bed was right up against the wall where the window was, I was not about to sit up and just investigate. The tapping continued for about 20 minutes. I guess in the meantime I must have fallen asleep, because the next thing I knew it was suddenly morning. I thought maybe it had just been a dream, and put it out of my mind for as long as I could. I got ready for school and went down to the bus stop, waiting with my sister who was two years older. Out of nowhere, this older man came up to the both of us and started to talk about how he wished his daughter was around on the weekdays so she could go to school with us and ride the bus. He then offered to drive us to school, since the bus seemed to be taking so long. We knew better, of course, and politely declined the man. We felt much more relieved when the big yellow bus pulled up a few moments later. The man seemed visibly disappointed, but still maintained his smile and told us to have a great day. We decided not to tell our parents because we thought they would get mad at us for talking to someone we didn't know. That night, the creepiness reached a whole new level, though. I began to hear more tapping on the window, only now it was far more distinct and much stronger as well. I turned over thinking my blinds would still be down. I realized in complete horror that they were now pulled three-fourths of the way up. I was face to face with that same creep from earlier, as he just stared in at me through my window. A slight smirk crossed his face. He told me to unlock the window so I could come outside and play with him and his daughter. I'm on the spectrum myself. I've trusted people way too easily because of this, and I thought about how fun that might be. Disregarding the time, I said in full sincerity, Let me go ask my mom first. His face turned immediately into a scowl I'll never forget. He started to slam on the window and demanded I open it immediately. At this point, my dad rushed into the room and turned on my light. He had heard part of my side of the conversation and pieced together what was going on. He made eye contact with the man for about two seconds before running outside to confront him. Unfortunately, he did not catch up with the guy, but he did call the police. It turns out the man did have a daughter that he lost custody of due to sexually assaulting her years ago. She did not live with him and had not done so in a long time. I don't remember what he was charged with, but I believe he spent some time in prison since he was already on the registry. I apologize if there are some errors or things that may not make sense. This perspective of my story is told from part by me and part by a friend. This happened to me in the weekend of Halloween. I personally don't like talking about it. I've been told by my friend to share it though, as it might help me get some things off my chest. Me and a friend were invited to a house party just for college students in the richer area of town. The house was huge, with an anchor of land and pool area. This party was themed to be a little bit naughty, so my friend dressed in a sexy nurse outfit, and I dressed up as a belly dancer. 
a majority of the party took place in the house. There were maybe 70 people or so, and with the house being as big as it was, it was very spacious and not very difficult to get around. I'm not much of a drinker myself, but I did have some juice that was available. Some of my friends during the meantime pulled me and my friend over to take some pics, and I set my drink down in the meantime. After what felt like an hour of just taking pictures, I found my cup and took another sip, not even thinking that I'd left my cup alone for a while. A man then came up to me immediately, who looked to be in his late 20s or early 30s. He told me my boyfriend's name and said he'd been trying to call me this whole time. That's when I realized I didn't have my phone on me. I have loads of respect for my boyfriend. We always make sure to stay in contact with each other. And since he had to work, I promised I would contact him. It seemed I'd forgotten. The man said it was very urgent and said I could use his phone to call in one of the rooms. Not thinking much of it, I followed the man. If my boyfriend really needed to call me, I knew it must be something terrible. As we entered the room, though, it felt as if I'd just run a mile and been winded. The man closed the door behind me, sat me down on the bed, and gave me his phone. I started to feel more weak, like I'd just gotten a migraine. I couldn't find the strength to press any of the buttons. Then I was helped to lay down, and within seconds, I was out cold. I woke up later, not even sure where I was or what even happened. I found my friend rubbing a napkin on my tummy while yelling. It took me a bit to come back to reality, and I realized I was in a bedroom with my friend cleaning something off of me. And that's when I had a panic attack, and I realized I'd quite possibly just been used. My friend calmed me down and told me the worst hadn't happened. She explained she couldn't find me anywhere and assumed I'd just gone to the bathroom. After many minutes, I still didn't show though. She went looking for me, eventually checking the bedrooms. She found me lying in bed with the guy sucking my belly button. She told me he was playing with my unconscious body, sucking my belly button, licking salt from my chest, and even kissing my lips. She didn't know how long this went on for. I immediately felt sick and coughed up just from the thought. Thankfully, my boyfriend got off work early after my friend told him what happened. He picked me up while my friend asked around about the guy, but of course, no one recognized him, nor had anyone even invited him there. I was taken to urgent care and looked at. Thankfully, nothing was wrong with me, and the drug in my drink didn't cause any further harm than just knocking me out. I wish the story ended there, but I started to receive texts from a random guy afterward. At first, he would just ask me random things. When I didn't reply, he showed me a pic of my own torso and began to say creepy things to me. It gave me the impression that the guy had been stalking me for a while. This is still going on today, actually who just text me randomly out of nowhere. I've had the idea to try to bait him one of these days to finally catch him, but I don't know how smart he is, or what he'll do to me if things don't go as planned, so I haven't done that yet. I grew up out in the wooded country in Illinois, on a short, dead-end street 10-plus miles from town. There were seven houses in the area, spread out on 2.5-acre wooded lots or larger each. There were no large wild animals, and people didn't meander there or show up lost ever. Actually, lost folks or large animals wandering around never happened once in the 20 years I lived there. Please keep that in mind. When I was a young girl in my early teens, I had a good guy friend a few years older than me who lived next door, Terry. Terry was allowed to go out with his friends much later than I was. He would sometimes tromp over to my yard after getting home late at night. He'd throw rocks from the gravel area outside at my window for me to come and chat with him. My bed was right next to that window. I'd open it up and we'd whisper stories and generally talk for a bit. My second story window faced our backyard, and his house was to the side. I could see his house from my window over the shrub trees and walking path to his driveway. I'd often know if he was out or already home, based on the light by his side door entrance. One time during the summer when my window was open, I heard a car in his driveway dropping him off. I was probably 14 years old, and it was around midnight or so. I heard Terry get out of a car and talk to his friends. 
Soon after, his friends pulled away. I called out softly, as loud as I could without waking my parents, asking Terry to stop by and chat. He didn't respond, as he probably didn't hear me. I then came up with the not-so-brilliant idea to sneak outside and scare him. I'd spent so many years in the woods learning how to blend in and be silent. As kids, we'd often sneak around and scare each other. I silently snuck down from the second floor and out my back garage door, which led to our backyard below my window. That led to Terry's house off the side to our gravel area, then through a well-worn path through the woods about 25 feet long. My parents had put in a gravel pit around the back of the house, probably because nothing much grew due to the shade of the oak trees. I picked my way expertly and silently across the log rounds facing Terry's house. My eyes got accustomed to the dark. I didn't see him anywhere. Also, at that time, I heard the door of his house close and the light going off, signaling he'd likely gone in and to bed. I waited for a bit. I thought I saw something move in the woods between our houses, but not on the path we'd always use. If you didn't use the path, there were wild rose and raspberry plants that had thorns and were quite painful to walk through if you weren't careful. Not that it was quite odd that he'd be in the woods, but maybe he wanted to scare me too like I was planning to do to him. I saw something human-sized and dark, moving through the woods slowly and carefully, pausing every once in a while like me. It was coming closer, and I definitely saw it. It was strange though that he wasn't walking directly to my window to talk. I hunched down and waited in silence, wondering if I could startle him. I still thought it was Terry. I thought he'd seen me sneak out and was trying to scare me. I watched the dark outline of a human figure moving. Then I would lose all sight of it in the foliage. It seemed to be stalking slowly and listening and checking every few feet while hiding. I whispered after losing patience one last time for Terry, but he didn't answer. I got bored of hiding and crouching, so I quietly tiptoed back to my garage door and went back inside silently, locking up as I went. I snuck back upstairs to my room above the area where I was just standing. My window was open. I definitely heard someone walking around in the yard. I whispered again for Terry out my window, but got no answer. I then heard something fall and grunt pretty loudly in the window well right below my window. It wasn't enough to wake my parents, but definitely loud enough that I couldn't mistake it. It sent a shock of fear through me. If you aren't familiar with what a window well is, it's a semi-circle-sized hole connected to the house, dug out about three or four feet deep and reinforced with metal. It allows a basement window to be put in below ground level, and the hole lets some natural light in. There's no way Terry would have fallen into our window well. We had been playing hide-and-seek in many outdoor games for years since we were young. Around the whole neighborhood, we knew every aspect of that area. The grunt sounded like a person. They pulled themselves out quickly. That's when I realized this was not a fun game. Someone was out there, and it was not Terry. I tried to look outside my window as best I could, but there was a screen to keep the bugs out. I couldn't lean my head out because of this to see next to the wall of our house directly below me. I heard the crunch of rocks, as whoever it was was stepping all over the noisy gravel. I pretty much sat there with my face pressed against the screen two stories up for half an hour. I never heard them leave. I grew too tired to stay awake though, and eventually passed out on my bed right next to the window. There were a few things I'm certain of. It was not Terry. I asked him later and he said he went to bed that night when he got home. I'm pretty sure it also wasn't one of our neighbors. I just had to share this experience I had. It was quite terrifying at the time it happened. When I was maybe 12 or possibly a little bit older, I was waiting for my ride after school one day. All of a sudden this big white family van pulled up right in front of me and asked me if I was waiting for my ride. My family just so happened to own a van just like this one, so it wasn't suspicious or anything to me at first. Maybe it was a bit dumb, but I answered that yes, I was. He was asking an obvious question, I suppose, since here I was sitting outside the school by myself. I answered nonetheless. Then he asked me what my name was. 
I hesitated, but he explained that he was looking for someone, so I gave him my name. I told him my name was Thea, and he said, Oh, it's you! You know, your mom asked me to come pick you up from school. He introduced himself as Sam, my mom's nephew. I had never really met my mom's family, so I was none the wiser. Eager to get home and out of the bitter cold, I didn't even question him very much, even though I was somewhat skeptical. I just jumped right into the car. Thinking back on it now, I realize how dumb that was, and just how lucky I was to get away. I got in, and immediately we started driving in the opposite direction of my house. At first, I thought it was no big deal. There was a route on this way to my place, just a bit farther down the road. Soon, though, we passed by that route as well. Out of nowhere, I realized we were now on the motorway. All traces of tiredness immediately left me, and I was on the verge of tears. I asked him if he could please take me home. If my mom sent him, he should know I'm not really allowed to go out after school. The man kept on ignoring everything I had to say. At this point, I started officially bawling my eyes out. Cars passing us on the motorway or sitting next to us in traffic were beginning to stare at our vehicle. At one point, I was crying so much, the man slammed his hands on the steering wheel and started mumbling about how this would be so much easier for both of us if I would just shut my fucking mouth. I wasn't thinking straight, though. I knew that anything would be better than making it to wherever this man was taking me. The very next time the car slowed down in traffic, I unlocked the door and jumped out, even though we hadn't come to a full stop yet. In all honesty, I wasn't thinking at all in that moment, because if I thought about it for even a moment, I know I would have chickened out. For once, I'm glad I didn't. I hit the ground and landed hard on my left leg. The pain was extremely bad. I didn't care though, because in my head anything was better than being stuck in that car. The man didn't even bat an eye. I feel like in the chaos he tried to reach out and grab me, but once I was outside the vehicle, he just sped away through the rest of traffic. A driver beside us almost hit me, but stopped just in time and got out and ran towards me. They called the police, and my parents as well. To this day, I'm not allowed to wait outside anywhere, and even before I'm done with whatever I'm doing, my parents will always be outside waiting. When I was around 10 or so, my parents and I went to visit my grandmother for spring break. My cousin also came to visit as well, and we decided we wanted to go to the YMCA for the day. My grandmother dropped us off and said she would come and pick us up in four hours. On that day, the YMCA was empty. There were a couple of adults in the exercise room, but that's about it. We went to the basketball court, and after two hours of playing tag and shooting baskets, we were quite bored. I've never been the biggest fan of swimming, but this YMCA had a pretty cool pool area. We changed into our bathing suits and headed in there. The pool was completely empty, all except for the lifeguard. We played a bunch of games and swam some laps, but after an hour, there wasn't much left to do yet again. There was no one except us to hang out with to keep things interesting either. We decided to play a bit of a game, seeing how long we could hold our breath underwater. We stood in the shallow end near the clock on the wall so we could time ourselves. Instead of fully submerging, we'd just stick our heads face down in the water a bit. We did this a couple of times and I ended up winning. On our very last round, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I figured it was my cousin giving up and telling me I'd won. Instead, it was the lifeguard who told me to knock it off or she was going to have to ask us to leave the pool. Since we were tired of being in there anyway, we figured we'd just get out. We'd get dressed, go back to the basketball court until our grandmother picked us up and just wait there. We only had an hour left anyways and the water was freezing by this point. As we got out, the lifeguard stopped us and asked us if we wanted to go into the sauna to warm up and dry off. The sign said 18 years or older, so of course we were super excited she allowed us to even do that. She walked us to the sauna and unlocked the door. The door was glass, and the interior was made entirely out of wood. Inside above the door, there was a clock, 
probably to make sure you were not in there for an unsafe amount of time. The lifeguard stand was adjacent to the sauna, but if you looked out the door you could very clearly see it. She followed us in, went over to the thermometer encased in plastic, and unlocked it so she could crank up the heat. I figured she must have to turn it on each time or something, so I didn't really think much of it. Both my cousin and I were very short girls, so we couldn't actually see the temperature that was printed on the thermometer knob. We knew she was turning up the heat at least. She left and shut the door behind her. I thought I saw her lock the door as well. I thought to myself, though, why would she lock the door when we might want to get out? I checked the clock and decided we should leave in about ten minutes or so. It was already plenty warm in the sauna, but the room only began to get more blazing. It felt nice at first because I was so cold from the pool. After about 15 minutes, though, it was starting to get a bit too hot. My cousin agreed we should leave so we could get dressed. I went to turn the knob on the door, only to find that it would not budge at all. I thought maybe it had been jammed, so I shook it as hard as I could. It still wouldn't open. I then let my cousin try. She couldn't get it to open either. We figured the lifeguard would be back in a couple of minutes anyway, so we sat back down and waited. The room was getting hotter and hotter, and I really wanted to leave. We got up and started banging on the door for help, shaking and twisting the knob trying to get the guard's attention. As the room continued to get hotter, we began to scream at the top of our lungs for her to let us out, but she just stared straight ahead ignoring us. There's no way she wouldn't have noticed or heard us banging and kicking the door and screaming. By now, we had been in there for 25 minutes. It was so hot in the sauna I could barely even breathe. It felt like my lungs were on fire. My skin and eyes were burning. We sat back down and put our towels over our heads. They were at least still a little bit damp and made it easier to breathe. I was worried about my cousin especially. She was a couple of years younger than me and she was really struggling. I looked at the clock and saw we had been stuck inside for 35 minutes. I got up and walked to the door again. I saw the guard still just staring straight ahead. Again, I tried to get her attention by screaming we needed out right now. I banged on the door as hard as I could, but still nothing. I was starting to get dizzy. I went to sit back down, but the wooden seats were so hot that they burned my skin. The towel was completely dry, so I put it underneath me to cover my skin. My hair was also extremely dry. I wrapped it across my face to cover my nose and squinted my eyes so they wouldn't burn as badly. I tried my best to still watch if anyone walked past the door. It helped me a bit. My cousin was laying down with the towel over her head, not moving or saying anything anymore. I nudged her to make sure she was still okay. I could tell we really needed to get out of here right now. She was extremely disoriented. It had been 45 minutes now and I was beginning to get nauseous. There was no way the lifeguard had simply forgotten we were in there. I thought she would come back soon, but there was a little voice in my head telling me that she'd purposefully locked us in there. Finally, a man just happened to be walking past the door to the pool. I was too weak to even get up though. My whole body was on fire. I was too dizzy to stand. Luckily, the man wasn't going to the pool. He wanted to be let into the sauna and came back with the lifeguard. I saw them walking this way and immediately jumped up to grab my cousin. I knew now for sure she had locked us in there because as she neared the door, she pulled out her keys to unlock it and let the man in. I didn't want to take any chances of us being trapped in there any longer. As the man was trying to walk in, I was desperately trying to shove our way out. As we were trying to escape, the lifeguard began to shut the door and try to push me back inside. The man was clearly confused about what was going on. Hey, what are you doing? I think they want to get out. The lifeguard let out a huge sigh and opened the door fully. I grabbed my cousin and ran as fast as I could to the changing room. We only had about 10 minutes before grandmother was supposed to pick us up. We were both so shaken by what just happened that we didn't say anything to each other as we got dressed or on the car ride home. When we got back to the house, my parents were making us dinner and I told them the story of what happened. They thought I must have been exaggerating and told me they didn't believe me. I truly believed that woman was going to let us cook alive in there. The only bit of doubt I have is what would have happened if we'd actually died. She obviously would have gotten the blame. So what was her endgame? I'm 21 now, but I still think about this interaction all the time. 
when I'm in small spaces or I get too warm, I still have panic attacks. No one I tell ever believes this story. I mean, I get it, it's pretty absurd, I know. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask for opinions or whatnot, but what do you think this could have been? Some crazy misunderstanding? Or do you think she really wanted us to die? If so, why? I was always an extremely small and sickly child. I looked young for my age because of this. My family and I lived out of town, about eight miles or so away. Our little community was right next to a highway. The school bus would drop me off about two blocks away from home every day. One day, as I was dropped off, I noticed a red truck following slowly behind me. So slowly, I figured they must have been just looking for a house address or something. I ignored it and continued walking home. That was the end of that, I thought at least. Consistently though, every day this truck would appear to follow slowly behind me. After a couple of days of this, I walked into my house, I was always the first one home, and peeked out of the window. I could see inside was an older man in a black lab. He was staring at me, just idling inside his truck by my home. All of a sudden he met my eyes and pulled away. I decided enough was enough. I told my parents about the truck that had been following me. Of course, my sister was quick to jump in and chime that I was lying. I had a habit of telling stories at the time. Thankfully, though, my mom believed me right away. Instead of allowing me to go by myself, she drove me to the bus stop the next morning. The red truck was there, just across the street at the gas station, pointing directly at the bus. I hopped on the bus. Meanwhile, my mom decided to drive around the truck and get a better look. She described the scene later to me. The man was extremely disheveled and dirty, hunched over in his seat and giving an empty stare at the bus. His license plates were caked over in mud, so she couldn't see the numbers at all. It freaked her out so much she called the police and the school. I went to school and was quickly pulled into the office as soon as I arrived. The man had been spotted at the school, waiting there in his truck. That day, I rode the bus home. This time, the truck was parked alongside the street. I would have had to walk past this man's driver's side door to get home. I debated on what to do. Apparently, this man was getting quite desperate now that he'd been spotted. A police car was nearby, thankfully, and I talked to the policeman. They went to go confront the man. As soon as they approached him, though, he pulled away from the curb and took off down the highway. I never saw him again, and I don't believe he was ever caught either. Because of this experience, I'm extremely guarded and paranoid with my own daughter and her soon-to-be sibling. The world is a terrifying place these days, and children can go missing so easily. I don't like to think about what would have happened if I'd been grabbed. I suppose I wouldn't be here typing this, and my kids wouldn't exist either. I was lucky that day. Many people are not. If you haven't already heard it, this story is a continuation of my last post. A man had been following me around as I was walking home from school, and on one day took the chance to grab my shirt from behind and try to attack me with my own headphones. That's relevant information for this scenario, as it's the same man who's doing this as well. The man who'd been watching me as I came home from school started walking back and forth to and from the sidewalk in front of my house. He'd done this three times since I last shared that story. Every time I saw him, I was always home alone. I called my mother to let her know every time he was around, and we contacted the police as well to tell them he kept on coming by our house. They haven't been able to do anything except record it since he's never actually stepped foot on our property, at least until recently. Starting this week, though, I started noticing tapping and scratching sounds from downstairs, starting as soon as it would become dark. It worried me a great deal, of course, but I was too scared to look outside, until very recently. My dogs weren't barking, and they would always do that if someone strange was outside. When I finally got the courage to look out, though, I saw a person, 
hunched over a few feet away from the entrance to our home. I couldn't see any of their facial features because they were wearing a large hood completely pulled over their face. It looked like they were scraping something against the siding of our home. Immediately, I dialed the police and hid somewhere in case they wanted to break in. As soon as the police arrived, though, the person ran off faster than I ever imagined and was not pursued. I spoke with the police when they started to check things out again, but nothing could be done. There was no proof of who the person could possibly be. They'd only seen him running off. They said they would keep an eye on it in the future, but at the very most, all that had happened so far was trespassing. I brought up the fact that I had been attacked not long ago by a strange man. I thought it must have been the same person, but once again I was brushed off. The police said it was possible, but without any actual evidence that they were the same person, nothing could be done. I couldn't accurately recognize the person outside my window, and I hadn't been seriously injured in the attack either. I don't know what kind of evidence is needed to do something about someone stalking a minor home alone, but apparently I had no such thing. This morning, a small brown package was left on the doorstep. In it were pieces of electronic parts I didn't recognize, and plastic shards with crumpled newspaper at the bottom. There was also a note that said, I'm sorry, with a frowny face at the top. My mother notified the police, and again they said they'd just keep an eye out for anything suspicious. I feel like they're not doing anything, and they won't do anything until I'm attacked again or worse. I took some advice from some previous mentions, and now I keep glitter spray with me when I walk home from school, along with a screwdriver and a knife in my room, just in case someone breaks in. I can't really do much else. I'm not confident at all I could win in a fight against this man. I'm worried about what will happen in the future, and I don't even feel safe in my own home. Even when the doors are locked, I check every possible place someone could be waiting for me before settling down. I don't think it's enough, though. Any advice is welcome. More than anything, I just want him to leave me alone. Some friends went to Mexico for a vacation and asked me to house sit and take care of their dogs while they were away. They pay me about $40 a day just to sit around and let the dogs out when they need to go. I'm disabled anyway, so that helps me quite a bit. This is a semi-rural area, and the houses are roughly a quarter mile apart. Police have to come from town 15 miles away, and the response time can be well over an hour. Because of this, I always take my pistol with me. It's always been quiet whenever I've stayed there, though, so there was no need to use it. This time was different, though. I was in the shower when the dog suddenly started barking, growling, and going crazy. They're big, large German shepherds. One is actually police trained. The owners loan him out to the county as a drug dog. If you tell them to be quiet, usually they'll obey. This time, they didn't, though. I went on high alert immediately. I shut off the water and tried to peek out the window. I couldn't see anything. When I walked out of the bathroom, though, I saw a shadow flit across the bedroom window. I whispered to the dogs to be quiet for a moment, and then they did. That's when I heard a distinctly male voice. I couldn't make out everything they were saying, but I distinctly heard two words. Come around. I'm sure there must have been more than one person because of this. I ran to the living room and grabbed my pistol when I saw the door handle begin to turn. I have a gun and I will fucking use it! I shouted. I heard multiple pairs of feet sprinting away. I was telling Siri to dial 911 and thankfully connected to the county sheriff quite quickly. She said there were two cars on another call not far away, but it would take 20 minutes for them to arrive. That was better than the usual hour, of course, but I was still pretty shaken. I explained I was on a farm and would have to go down to the road by myself and unlock a cattle gate to let them in. I notified them to tell the officers that I would be carrying a pistol and to not shoot me by mistake, because I was not going outside without it. The dispatcher reassured me, the one good thing about living in a red state, I suppose. She asked me if I could see the road. I could, so she said to wait by my house until I saw the blue lights coming up. I hung up and called my friends in Mexico. 
They had cameras, and the footage could be downloaded via app. They said they would go through it while I waited for the cops to arrive. I locked that house down and went down to the gate when the police arrived. They searched the whole area, including the barn, but didn't find anyone. While they were looking, my friends texted me the camera footage. In it, there was a man on the porch. Unfortunately, the cameras were not angled to get a shot of his face. It was very dark. The other angle showed there was more than one creep as well. The police were very nice and said they had passed a man on a bike on the way there, which was strange for this area, especially at night. They went to look for him, but he had totally disappeared. They took a full report, but they never caught the creeps. My husband came and stayed with me for the rest of my friend's trip. One of their neighbors said he found a tent and some gear in the woods a few weeks before, so somebody was definitely living out there. Maybe a homeless person from town or something. I've house sat again since then, and it was completely quiet. They're going away again for Christmas, and I'll be there once more. A lot of people ask me if I would have shot the person had they broken in. And yeah, absolutely, why not? I would be sorry if I had to hurt somebody. But if it's them or me, of course I'd do so. Several years ago, I was in the midst of an acrimonious divorce from my then-husband. Full of crazy allegations and typical angry filings centered around the custody of our child. As with many divorces, friends and colleagues seemed to pick one side or the other. In my case, there was one sort of professional contact who reached out to me after hearing about the divorce, who offered to be a witness for my case. There were some experiences he related that I had previously been unaware of regarding my ex's behavior out at networking events. After this initial call, he started to call on a semi-regular basis to make sure I was okay. Mind you, this was not someone I knew well prior to the separation. He was also much older than I was, but claimed to be very experienced with divorce and custody. I figured it was a good idea to be polite and not alienate him. His testimony was really important to my case, per the words of my lawyer. I kept things strictly friendly, but I always got a weird feeling about him. After a few months, he called one day, and that happened to be a day my son was very sick. When I told him I couldn't talk and explained why, he offered to run to the store for me. Honestly, I really appreciated that. After that, though, he kept on dropping by the house uninvited or would stop by with various gifts for my son. Again, I kept telling myself to simply keep things polite. The divorce was coming soon anyway. I really couldn't afford to make this guy mad. During this time, he had also helped me set up a security camera system my dad had mailed me. At one point, I needed someone to walk my dog, and he had offered to do it. He used and returned a spare key that same day. One evening, he showed up while I was painting and insisted on sticking around to help, even though I was having my starting over catharsis and wanted to do it alone. Just after that day, he came around once again uninvited and unannounced with magazine photos of decor and started carrying on in this manic way about how we could finish decorating the house. I was so weirded out that I made an excuse to leave. I started ignoring his calls altogether and took my son and dog to stay at my parents for several weeks to avoid another drop-in. I came home a few weeks later, thinking he must have gotten the hint by now. It was a very quiet day. The following morning, I took my son on an outing, something like the zoo, I believe. We both came back quite hot and tired. I put my kid down for a nap in my bed and decided to lay down and close my eyes with him. I woke up maybe an hour or so later. It took me a moment to realize that something was way off here, as I was blinking off the sleep. I realized there was a rose bush sitting on my bedside table. I had most definitely not put that there. There was a post-it note on it as well, something about planting it in the yard. I recognized the handwriting immediately and stood up to go splash some water on my face. I tried to decide whether to simply call my parents or phone the police. As I stepped in my bathroom, I realized the mirror was now covered in post-it notes, 
all with super creepy messages, love notes, and calls of affection. Honestly, it really scared me. I was still waking up and trying to figure out how all this could have possibly gotten into my house in the hour I was asleep. The front door was still definitely locked. As I went from room to room, though, there were notes placed everywhere. I mean thousands of post-it notes covering the walls in my cabinets. It was even one inside my coffee maker. I started to grab all of them and put them into a big pile. Then I got to one in the kitchen that made my blood run cold. You know, you're really cute when you think no one is watching you. I realized then that there was a security camera pointed right where that note had been left. The one that man had helped me set up months earlier, when I didn't think he was a psychopath. I called my parents in hysterics. I sent them a bunch of photos, and my dad insisted I should not call the police. Remember, this was during a custody battle. He said instead he would drive over and change the locks and put a chain on the door. We also immediately changed the passwords on the cameras, which had been installed to document if my ex tried to break into the house. That was the initial purpose at least. This man had access though, and could apparently see and hear everything going on inside my house for months. The security cameras, I realized, he had copied my passwords when I was setting up the system. The only way I could figure out that he got into my house is he must have made a copy of my house key the day I gave it to him. Because my dog had gotten to know him, he wouldn't have barked to try to warn me either. That scared me the most. I was absolutely horrified. This man had been in my house for a long time. There's no way he could have put up that many notes very quickly. He must have been right next to me, feet away from my son while we were both sleeping, and somehow he thought all this was okay. I left and stayed with my parents again for a few days, afraid of what the guy was going to do when he realized he was now both physically and digitally locked out of my house. When I came home, my son had gone to his dad's for the night. I was home alone, on the phone with another friend from out of town. At about 10 p.m., the man showed up at my door, pounding on it, trying the locks, screaming obscenities and demanding to be let in to his house. Gone were all of the niceties. This was someone completely furious and derailed. All I could do was hide in my bedroom until he left an hour later. This was St. Patrick's Day, so I'm sure he'd been drinking as well. After that, there were several other times someone would start knocking on the door in the middle of the night, always when my son wasn't home. He tried reaching out using fake social media accounts as well, always getting blocked. Years later, I discovered he had secretly befriended my mom on Facebook and therefore was still able to see all of the photos of us she posted or shared. I saw when she left her computer logged on that they were having a conversation about how he could get back into my life. I sold that house two years later, still finding new notes even as I was packing up. I'm more than relieved he no longer knows where I live. I don't post photos of my new house online now. I changed all the privacy settings on my social media accounts. I avoid all the places he used to go and the networking events he attends. I stay as under the radar as possible. I could never bring myself to play back the security camera videos. I was already traumatized enough and didn't want to see just how much danger we could have been in. Alright, here we go. Nearly a year ago now, on Christmas Day, I was at my dad's with some of my siblings. We celebrated Christmas, then after dinner my dad headed off to be with his girlfriend at her apartment. Left in the house were my 16-year-old uncle, my 16-year-old brother, me who was 15, and the youngest who was still only a toddler. I woke up early the next morning, the day after Christmas, and sat on the floor beside an outlet on my tablet. Everyone else was still sleeping, when I began to hear a banging on the back door. At first, I thought it was my dad coming back, but the banging got louder and went on for far too long. For lack of a better term, I guess I dissociated. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't move until I heard the back door breaking in. I had been paranoid about home invasion due to our area in the city before, but I had no idea what to do in this situation. All I could do was stand there in shock. I put down my tablet slowly and picked up a nearby flashlight. 
I think my thought process was to attack whoever broke in with it. When the back door gave out, I heard the person quickly go through the downstairs and stomp up the stairs. It seemed he stopped right outside the door of the room I was in. The man opened the door, turned left, turned right, and then saw me sitting there on the floor, beside the outlet less than three feet away from him. He was taller than my dad, wearing a completely black ski mask. He had the big rusty crowbar with a blue handle. He was wide and looked a bit on the older side as well. In that moment, I took a small breath and screamed louder than I ever have before. It must have lasted for a good 20 seconds. Once I screamed, he yelped a bit too, then ran downstairs and out of the house. I went to the top of the staircase after he was already down them and out the hallway. I screamed out for him to please leave. Looking back, I guess asking a house invader to leave is kind of useless, especially when he's already leaving and he'd already broken in. But I'm sure you can imagine I was not thinking at my best in the moment. My screaming woke up my uncle and older brother. I told my older brother what just happened, as he was half awake and extremely confused. I ran downstairs. My uncle had just come up from his room in the basement. I quickly told him someone had broken in and left after I screamed at them. He already had a knife on him and told me to grab one too. I did after making sure the robber had left the house and checking quickly on the toddler, who was somehow sleeping through all of this. My uncle told me to guard the back door and stab anyone who came through while he checked the area outside. We could find neither hide nor hair of where the robber had gone. I held the knife and stood beside the broken back door, knowing that if he came back, I really couldn't do anything. I'd never fought anyone before, and I was just a child holding a small knife. Thankfully, they didn't try to return. My uncle came back and said they must have had a getaway driver, since there was no way he could have gotten away so fast on foot. None of us had phones, so my older brother called my dad over Instagram on a tablet to tell him what happened. We explained everything. We all sat and waited for my dad. We talked and realized this had likely been very planned. The invader came in when there was no car in the driveway, and after entering, he ran directly upstairs, ignoring all the new Christmas presents, the electronics, an expensive alcohol collection, and even two easy-to-grab game consoles smack dab in the middle of the living room. He went directly for my dad's room, where me and my brother were. My dad collects valuable shoes, and I guess has some expensive watches he keeps in the closet. Only someone who was friends with my dad, who'd been in the house before, would have known about those collections, and known the right place to go as well. When my dad came back, he asked me over and over about how the intruder looked. I told him again and again, while he and my uncle tried to think of which friend it could have been. I was the only one who'd saw the guy, and had been less than three feet away from him. I was in direct physical danger from some stranger I'd never met. We didn't call the cops, as the police in our area are known for being less than unhelpful. As Christmas is getting closer again, I'm worried about being back there around the same time that person broke in. I've had a harder time sleeping, and I've been more paranoid as well. I understand I was and am very lucky that I wasn't hurt, and all we got was a broken back door. But honestly, I really hate the person who broke in. I really hope that wherever he is, nobody likes him. I've hesitated to share this story for a long time because I know how important the mutual trust between a resident and their landlord slash maintenance staff is. I don't want to instill any unnecessary distrust in anyone's landlord. I've shared stories before about dangerous, scary residents I encountered while working at apartment complexes, but this is a story about the other side of things as a renter. Before I had even graduated from high school, I knew I wanted to live at Paradise Apartments. I was a bit naive at the time, drawn in by the multiple amenities I would never use. But I primarily wanted to live there because the complex was pet-friendly and also within my small budget. When the time eventually came for me to get my own place, I sublet the only apartment they had available and moved in. Unfortunately, I soon came to realize 
this apartment was not as nice as I'd originally thought it was. The building was old, but remodeled, so it had all the typical plumbing issues and extremely thin walls. I also learned it was not the safest part of town either. I was primarily an online student, but I had one class that met in person twice a week, around 8 a.m. or so. I'm a bit of a homebody, so I rarely left during the day, except for that class. Maybe the occasional shopping excursion or to spend some time with my boyfriend in the evening after he got off work. My apartment was a bit of a Bermuda Triangle. Even though it was only 600 square feet and I lived alone, things had a way of growing legs and simply walking away and disappearing. I had two kittens at the time and blamed them regularly for all these things going missing. Something odd that kept reoccurring, however, was that I'd find my underwear box out and sitting in the center of my bedroom floor on days when I knew I had class. I didn't have a proper dresser. Instead, using an Ikea shelf with some Ikea boxes for designated clothes. You know, one for socks, one for pants, one for pajamas, etc. I could have sworn I'd put the underwear box away after getting ready for class, but I simply chalked it up to me forgetting, as a result of having to get up so early. Arguably paranoid, I started to think that some of my laundry was disappearing as well. Favorite articles of clothing would go into the laundry hamper and seemingly never come back out. And towards the end of that semester, I was working one evening on a homework assignment when my boyfriend called me to let me know his roommate had accidentally locked him out of their apartment. I had a spare key to their place, so he asked if I could run over real quick and let him in. Before I left, I made a mental note that I had left literally every light in my apartment on. Because I was living on a pretty tight budget, normally I'd make a point of turning off all the lights when I left, but my boyfriend lived like five minutes away, so I knew I was going to be back very quickly anyway. Sure enough, I got back less than 15 minutes later. Immediately though, I could sense something was off. I could see the lights were now off through the blinds. I called my boyfriend and he drove over to meet me. We unlocked the door and went inside. The lights had all been turned off. Thinking maybe I'd had a power outage, I flipped the main light, only for it to immediately come on. My boyfriend checked the entire apartment. No one was inside, but someone had definitely gone through and systematically turned off every light, including my lizard's basking light, my laptop as well. We called the emergency maintenance number, and I explained that someone had been inside my apartment. They had to have used a key, because there was no sign of forced entry either. The manager called me back and told me I had to be imagining things. Maybe I'd just forgotten before I left. I assured him I wouldn't have turned off the lizard light to kill my own lizard. Someone had definitely been in my apartment. I was extremely worried because obviously this person had a key to get in. Either they worked for the complex or had been a previous tenant or guest. I asked if they had changed the locks after the previous tenant moved out, and they assured me they changed the locks every time. They then tried to suggest maybe it was a friend pranking me, someone else I had given a key to. Well, the only other people I had given keys to were my boyfriend and my mom, one of which was obviously with me right now. In any case, neither of them would have pranked me in this way anyway. After enough finagling, the manager finally agreed to send someone out to change the lock for my peace of mind. I brought up my concern it was someone on staff, since they would be the only other people with keys. The manager claimed the keys were locked in a special safe that required a personalized code in an office with a security camera as well. They changed the locks, but I had my doubts it would do much good. As far as I was aware, there were only two maintenance guys that worked on the complex. One nice older man that didn't seem all that skilled, and a younger guy with a scruffy beard who gave off a very bad vibe. I suspected it was him immediately. When I had first moved in, the manager had told me I would be getting a new kitchen counter within the first three days. I waited to move in my kitchen stuff, but after a week, they hadn't come. Then after a few months, I had completely forgotten about it. One day, I was sitting in my living room, and this scruffy maintenance guy walked in without knocking or announcing himself. I hadn't received a notice to expect him either. He said he was there to replace my countertop, but it took him two days to install one small piece of the counter. A few weeks later, I was getting out of the shower when I heard a single knock at the door. 
I called out and hurried to get some clothes. Not two seconds later, the door started to open and I had to slam it shut, still wrapped in a towel, to stop him from just coming in. He claimed he hadn't heard me, but I had my doubts. Another time, I found a note from him that he had come in while I was gone. Again, no reason given as to why. He made a note about my third cat being cute as well. Except I didn't have a third cat there. I did, however, have a picture of my childhood cat in my bedroom on the Ikea shelf where I kept all my clothes. At that point, I went to the office to ask them to make a note in my file that A. I wanted at least 24 hours notice before entry going forward and B. To always be present when they tried to come in. Now that I knew without a shadow of a doubt that someone was coming in secretly, it all added up together. It hadn't been long after the surprise maintenance visit stopped that things started moving around in my apartment. He was also on site all the time, so he must have known when I would come and go. Who knew how many times he had snuck in, how many small souvenirs he had stolen. He could have been coming in while I was asleep, and I would have never known. After the night with the lights, I put my own lock on the door. I still didn't totally trust the apartment. I ended up buying a condo shortly after, subleased the apartment, and moved. In the final days before I left, my mom came into town to help me move my stuff. While she was home alone, as I was at class, she caught the scruffy maintenance guy trying to get his key to work in my lock. She demanded to know what he was doing, and he said he was there to paint the front door. I didn't receive any notice, and he didn't have any supplies either. She told him he could wait until after I moved out. A few years later, I was shopped by the owner of Paradise Apartments while working at another complex in town. Shopping, by the way, is when an employee from one apartment complex takes a tour at another under the guise of wanting an apartment for the purpose of gaining information they might not easily give up. There were certain tells a shopper always gave. Asking specifically worded questions that required specific answers and were easy to trip up on. Being too wealthy for the complex, you know, being too flexible on what they were interested in. The guy seemed too old and too well off to be considering an apartment at where I worked. Normally, I wouldn't have badmouthed any other complexes. I preferred to win them over by showing them the positives of our community. But I told them I probably wasn't the best person to tell him about Paradise Apartments. I told him about my breaking in, and that I suspected it was someone on the maintenance staff. At that point, he revealed he was now the owner, and was very disturbed to hear I'd had this experience. He asked me to describe the man in detail. I assured him it was all in past, and I was over it, but he insisted on calling the manager. He answered that yes, there had been a scruffy young maintenance man he'd had to fire, because he'd been caught multiple times breaking into the apartments of single women. Satisfied, the owner proudly told me the issue had been resolved and asked if I would be willing to change my bad review. I told him no. None of this changed the fact I'd experienced this. Actually, it validated everything I expected. In the years I worked as a leasing agent, I learned a lot about where complexes will cut corners to save time. From my experience, a lot don't switch out the locks if the previous tenant was good. A lot didn't require background checks for employees, even though they did for the tenants. And keys also got passed out willy-nilly to maintenance and vendors and basically everyone who worked there. I wouldn't go so far as to say everyone operates this way, but everyone I worked at was doing this when I started there. If you're renting an apartment, be sure to stay diligent. If you have reason to believe someone is coming into your home, document it and let the staff and friends know. You never know who might have a key to your apartment. They seem to give those things out to everyone. So here's my story. For context, I live away from home for school, while my sister lives at home with our parents. Also, both our rooms face the street and are right next to each other. I have a full-length mirror in my room just opposite the window, so if I look into the mirror, I can see what's outside as well. Around Thanksgiving of 2021, I had just gotten home from school and was relishing my ability to stay up late. So was my sister. After our parents had gone to sleep, I was just laying on my bed watching some YouTube. I had my window blinds wide open, when for some strange reason, I felt the sudden need to look up immediately. 
my head snapped up to look in the mirror. Outside, I saw someone pop up from below my window. They began to bang on it three times, before suddenly sprinting away. I was shaking, on the verge of tears. I ran to my sister's room and explained what just happened. She was shaken up as well, but we chalked it up to just a dumb teenager. Just a few nights later at midnight, though, I see a text from my sister. Hey, did you hear that? There was somebody in front of my window. I felt that same fear. I took my headphones off and just began to get up when I heard five super loud bangs come from my sister's window. I ran over immediately. She looked really shaken. She told me the man ran to the other side of the house, the wall that was right next to my bed. He began to bang on my wall, right where my head would normally be. We were frozen in fear. We didn't catch the guy as he ran away immediately after. We made some theories as to who it was, but neither of us were the type to have any enemies. We did some investigating and also found out there were no teenagers on our street anyway. None of this made sense. Sometimes I feel that same chill in the air and think I hear the banging. I fear turning around and seeing that man's face in the window might not be as rare as many might hope. I'm praying I never have to meet that person again. I used to go out and explore the countryside whenever I could. I would do this just as often alone as with someone else. However, I haven't done it at all since an experience I had with a friend of mine when we were out hiking years ago. Now to be frank, the first thing I have to let you know is that the two of us were hiking in an area we didn't have any right to be in. This was usually the case when we decided to go for a hike. It was always more fun to explore areas like that than it was to go hiking in places known for nature hiking or whatever. It was cool to possibly be seeing something that most people won't normally get to see, and exciting to think about what we might stumble across. This was a hiking trip I took with my buddy Todd, when we were both still in college. We had a week off for spring and we wanted to do some exploring so we took a drive to a very rural area we had found online. Driving up into the hills, we found a convenient area to place our car in that we figured would be a safe spot. Then we hiked out into the woods. We had never actually been in this area before, so we had no set agenda of how we were going to explore, really. We simply started out completely blind, hiking out through the woods. We were pretty high up in the hills when we set out and the area we had parked the car in was actually very dark due to the amount of foliage in the area. It might have seemed a bit creepy at first if we wanted to take it that way. Actually though, there wasn't a whole lot that happened in the first few days. That's not to say we didn't see a lot of things or enjoy ourselves though. Just nothing really notable to be scary for someone reading this story. It was on the third night of our trip though that something really strange happened. We had set up our tents and were in them separately. I don't know if Todd had gone to bed yet or not by this point, but I had the impression that he was already fast asleep. I, however, was having a hard time and was staying up reading a book instead. It was around 11 p.m. that night, I believe. All of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a loud and shrill human scream. It cut through the regular sounds of the woods at night and startled me quite a bit. I dropped my book, took my flashlight, and rushed to get outside my tent. When I got there, Todd was working his way out too. I mentioned I thought he was sleeping. He seemed he was because he was slightly out of it. No sooner than he had worked his way out of the tent, we heard yet another scream cut through the night. More prepared for it this time, we were able to tell which direction it had come from. I was also able to discern that it seemed to be a male screaming as well. It seemed to be coming from a bit of a distance away from us. Todd asked what I thought we should do. I told him I had no idea. He suggested maybe we should try and find whoever was screaming and see if we could try and help them out. I agreed, but told him we should bring our knives with us just in case. So, armed with our knives and flashlights, we started out walking in the direction the scream seemed to have come from. I was hoping to hear another sound, regardless of how scary it might be. 
to try and narrow down where we were supposed to be going. Without any further sounds from the guy we heard screaming, it was really like trying to find a needle in a haystack. We were hesitant to try calling out at first. We had no idea exactly what had been hurting this person and causing them to scream. As we kept fumbling through the woods and trees though, more and more time passed since we'd last heard the person. We realized if we were going to help them out, we would have to hear from them. That meant we had to call out to him, even if it meant risking calling attention to ourselves. I called out a few times. It was terrifying to do so. If this person had been hurt by another human or an animal, we could be drawing that entity to us. We were pretty scared with every noise we heard run after. Unfortunately, we did not get any response, and no matter how hard we kept looking, we weren't able to find any trace of anyone in the dark. Worried that we might get lost after too long, we made the tough decision to go back and try to sleep instead. We would get up early the next morning and go out and see if we could find anything in the daylight, any clue as to what had happened. I don't think either of us managed to sleep the whole night though. There was the constant wondering of what we'd just heard, coupled with the feeling that something bad had just happened. The following morning, we went to go and check around once the sun had lit the entire area up. Todd seemed just as worn down as I had. Really, we didn't talk about anything though. We just went and searched the area as best as we could, now that we could actually see what we were doing. I don't know what we were hoping to find really. I kept fearing we would stumble upon a dead body, someone had been murdered in some brutal way or something. For some reason I kept focusing on the idea it was probably a person who had injured the man we'd heard and not an animal. It was Todd that eventually found something. He called me over to have a look. We found an area where there was obviously some sort of struggle. On the surrounding ground, surrounding trees, there was blood everywhere. A huge amount of blood. We looked around a little bit more after seeing that, but not for very long. We were too unnerved by the whole discovery. Instead, we went back to our camp and discussed our next options. We decided the best thing to do was to just hike back to the car and move on from there. I'm not going to go into too much depth about that because nothing really happened on the way back. I mean, we had a general sense of unease the entire time, of course. We were nervous and the slightest sound scared us. It was scary, but nothing else really happened. We gave a detailed report to the police, but no idea if anything ever came of it. We gave them our contact information, but we never heard back from them. I'll never forget this really strange house I lived in when I was a teenager. It wasn't for a very long time, and I was pretty thankful for that. That's because some really weird things went on inside that house. This isn't as much of a narrative as it is an explanation, perhaps. I'm sorry if that sort of thing isn't for you, but let me describe the house we lived in. The most important thing to know is that it was a suburban area. There were loads of other houses around, but they weren't piled on top of each other like they are in urban areas. The house was three stories, and it had a basement as well. It wasn't a finished live-in type of basement though. It was kind of weird actually. It was very dark, but not really dank. There wasn't a light switch at the top of the steps either. In order to turn the lights on, you had to go all the way down the steps and there was a bulb on the ceiling with a chain. The staircase was not complete either. It was one of those wooden board ones. In the beginning, I never really had a problem with the basement actually. We kept some of our things stored down there, plus it was sort of an unofficial playroom for us kids. Our toy box for the younger ones was down there. Most of the time, I wasn't really even in it much, so I didn't really give it much more than a passing thought. The first time I had a weird issue with the basement was something that's kind of hard to describe. One of my younger brothers didn't want to go down there by himself to get something, so he asked me if I could instead. I told him I would go with him, but he refused to go down there, even if he was going to be going with me. I didn't really give that too much thought in the moment. I understood it was easy for kids to be scared of such things. I went down into the basement, again not really thinking about anything. I turned the light on and went over to the toy box. As I was sorting through it though, the strangest thing happened. 
I heard what sounded like someone laughing. I turned around to see if my sister was in the basement, but she wasn't. In fact, I had thought she wasn't even home. Curious, I searched through the entire area. No one was in the basement at all, least of all anybody who could be laughing at me. So, for the first time, I felt a little bit unnerved. It hadn't gotten to a point where it really bothered me much yet, though. A little while later, I did ask my little brother why he didn't want to go into the basement, but he refused to tell me for some reason. He seemed extremely terrified of it, and he was the only one of my siblings who was like that. The others didn't seem to have any problem going down there. My dad was the type to force the kids to face their fears, but I wasn't like that really. I didn't want to torment my brother. So, for a while, if he wanted something down there, I would go get it for him instead. My parents were quite strict about toys going back in the box when we were done with them, so one day I had to go put away my brother's toy. I even remember what toy it was. It was a mad scientist dissect an alien. I had no problem, though. I went down to the basement, which was dark and a little bit cold, actually. I didn't really think too much about that, though. I walked down the steps and reached for the chain to turn on the light. Then I went over to the toy box and put the toy away. While I was standing there, once again I heard someone laughing behind me. This time it really bothered me. I'd very clearly heard it, and I knew no one was in the basement with me. For the first time, I actually felt a little bit scared. I decided to get out as quickly as possible. I went over to the stairs. I turned the light off. I was a little hesitant to do that, and almost just wanted to run up the steps. I didn't, though. I took my time walking up the stairs to be careful. Keep in mind, it was very dark in the basement. The steps were just bored, so I could see behind them, and there wasn't a lot of light. I could just barely see, and what I saw was terrifying. I saw a shadow looking at me from behind the steps, then quickly running away to where I couldn't see them anymore. Scared, I ran up the stairs as quickly as I could. I slammed the door and ran into the kitchen. My little brother was there, and I think he realized just how scared I was. You saw it, didn't you? He asked me. And that was nearly as scary as seeing itself. I was really freaked out, and I finally understood why he didn't want to go down there anymore. For the rest of the time my family lived in the house, my little brother refused to go down in the basement. Regardless of what I had seen, though, I still had to go down there every now and then. I was the big brother, of course, so it was sort of my job to not be scared. I sure was, though, every single time I went down there. My family moved a lot at the time, though, so we weren't there for very long. I was extremely glad when we moved away. If you're in the U.S., then you know that the weather has been absolutely terrible everywhere lately. Snow in L.A., tornadoes in the Midwest, so many storms, and they just keep on coming. And the most recent bout of storms brought with it something I'd never thought to be concerned about. I was home alone because my husband works nights. I already don't like that much, as I hate being home alone at night. I often double-check the door locks, the windows, and jump at just about every noise. If someone else is home, I'm perfectly fine, but when I'm home alone, I get easily scared. Add to that severe thunderstorms, and the threat of tornadoes when I live in a trailer, and you can imagine my anxiety. The rain was pounding on the roof and windows, and was only drowned out by the cracks of thunder that seemed almost constant. I was reading a book to distract myself, when the power suddenly went out. I swore and put down my book. I sat there, waiting for a moment, hoping the power would come back on, when the booming thunder made me jump. It rolled for what seemed like ages, as I sat there in my chair in the dark, wondering what I was supposed to do now. As the thunder ended, I noticed the night seemed oddly quiet. The wind, the rain, even the thunder were silent now. Was the storm passing? It seemed to be a bit quick for that, though. I was happy to think my power would be restored quicker if the storm ended sooner. I stood up, thinking to get myself a drink, and perhaps prepare for bed as I had nothing to do now. I used my phone as a flashlight and was walking toward the kitchen, marveling at the oddly quiet night. That was when I heard something distinctly not a part of the storm. 
It began low and quiet, and quickly ramped up into a piercing wail. I froze in place. The tornado siren. I didn't stay frozen for long. I ran into my bedroom and hunkered down in my walk-in closet. I didn't feel safe, though. All my life, I'd heard about what tornadoes do to trailer parks, and though I was deep in the closet, I was just imagining a tornado picking up the entire trailer. Me being tucked away in the closet wasn't going to do anything about that. It'd just throw me around. I suddenly realized that though I'd lost power, I hadn't lost everything. I had my phone and decided to actually use it for one thing I rarely use my phone for. I called my husband. I was panicking and barely got out two sentences before he said, Why don't you go to the shelter? I had completely forgotten our neighbors at a small tornado shelter nearby. They'd mentioned it a few times, and it wasn't all that far away. In my panic, it had completely slipped my mind. My neighbors were only in town on occasion, as their house here was their vacation house. I knew they weren't in town now, though, and expressed this to my husband. He told me they never locked it, though. It was a storm shelter, and they wanted to make sure anyone could get to it in case of an emergency. I hung up and stood to leave the closet. It sounded quiet outside, except for the siren. I quickly went to the door, slipped on my shoes, and went outside. It didn't seem to be raining, either. I heard no thunder and saw no lightning, but I could feel it in the air something very ominous. I turned the flashlight back on my phone and carefully walked down the porch steps. I walked quickly through my neighbor's yard. The shelter was a small structure, partially buried in the ground. As I reached for the door, the wind picked up and I felt the strangest thing. The rain began again, quickly, but it wasn't normal rain. It wasn't falling like normal. It was completely horizontal, I had heard of this, but experiencing it was something else entirely. I jerked open the door and ran inside, slamming it behind me. It was only upon reaching the bottom of the stairs, soaked from the sudden downpour if you could call it that, that I realized there was a light on, and I wasn't there alone. For half a second, I expected to see my neighbor there, or even another neighbor of ours using the shelter, as it had been left open for all of us. The shelter was small, though. Just a single room, no bigger than the average bedroom. Across the room, just feet away, lying on the built-in bench against the wall, was a man I'd never seen before. There were items strewn about him on the floor, and I knew he'd been living here for a while. He glared at me from the bench, setting up with the blankets hanging off his head and making him look like some perverse hobo nun. I stood at the foot of the stairs, frozen with uncertainty. A loud rumble of thunder reminded me why I had come down there, though. I forced myself to calm down. I had met homeless people around here before. There was no reason to immediately assume the man was dangerous. After all, he needed a place to stay during a tornado too. And here was an unlocked shelter just waiting to be used. Uh, hi? He just stared at me. I couldn't move from the foot of the stairs. I very much wanted to run back up them and into my house, but the roar from outside kept me from doing so. I was hearing the wind, and it sounded like a freight train. I'd heard it said before, but only now I realized it wasn't just being poetic. It sounded like the roar of an oncoming train muffled only by the fact I was underground. The man continued to glare at me, a look of utter hatred in his eyes. Look, I'm sorry to disturb you, but this is a tornado and this is my friend's shelter, I explained. The man suddenly stood up. This is my house, he shouted raising an arm and pointing at nothing. I know you've been staying here, I began, but he continued shouting, staggering towards me. It's my house. Mine. Get out! There's a tornado out there, I shouted back, not at all sure where I got the courage from. I was standing at the foot of the stairs, and I could hear the wind behind me. The sounds were stressing the metal. Get out! Get out! He shouted over and over again as he staggered toward me. I didn't know what to do. It wasn't like I could leave. There was a tornado going on outside. This man was coming at me, though. My eyes shot around the room for any sort of weapon, but there was nothing within reach. The man was much bigger than me, but his staggering gait made me think for a moment I could take him. He grabbed me with his strong hands, though, and all my pushing had no effect. Let go of me, I shouted. He just constantly shrieked, get out. He began trying to drag me up the stairs. He was going to throw me out into the tornado. 
I punched him hard across the face and screamed, There's a fucking tornado, you moron! This only made him more angry as he returned the slap hard. It hurt like hell, but I realized he was only holding me with one hand now. I wrenched myself from his grasp and lunged toward the other side of the room. I tripped and fell, but I kept scrambling, trying to grab anything I could use as a weapon. My hand fell on something long and hard. It felt like wood. As he stood over me and reached down to try and pick me up and drag me out again, I swung the object at his head and completely missed, of course. He wrenched it from my hand and threw it away, then picked me up. He tried to throw me over his shoulder, but I was having none of it. I struggled and kicked, and he had to half carry and half drag me to the door, all the time alternating between muttering my house and screaming get out. I was doing my best to make things difficult for him. I didn't want to be out in this storm. I didn't want to die in a tornado for some crazy man hiding in my friend's shelter. I kicked and screamed, struggled and scratched. One arm was at my chest and the other at my throat. I started to feel like I was choking. He was wearing a filthy shirt and he reeked. For some reason, this is what I thought before I squirmed my way into a position to bite his arm hard. I sank my teeth in as deep as I could. He howled and dropped me. I slid down the stairs and he shouted and cursed, shaking his arm. As I reached the bottom, I quickly crawled to the far end of the room. I was terrified of what he would do to get back at me for that. I also wanted to be as far away from that door and the tornado as I could get. When I reached the other side of the room and turned around, he hadn't followed me down the stairs though. Instead, he was standing there staring at me, glowering like he had been before. He was holding his wounded arm in the other hand. Suddenly, he turned, and with the roar of the wind, he opened the door and stepped out into the tornado. I was shocked. I sat on the bench furthest from the stairs and stared up at the now open door. I couldn't see anything but darkness, and the rain was now flowing down the steps. I huddled on the bench in the corner, staying away from the man's belongings. I didn't know if he was dead or if he'd ever be back, but I didn't want to touch them either. The wind and the siren filled the night, and a small waterfall formed on the stairs from the sheer rain. After a few minutes, though, it all died down. I sat there, lightly touching my face where he'd slapped me. I realized he could come back and be armed, much angrier as well. I grabbed the wooden object I'd tried to hit him with before. I was surprised. It was a wooden Lucky Cat statue, and it was also mine. Usually, it just sat on my front porch, but it had suddenly disappeared a few weeks ago. I thought it had gotten blown away in a previous storm or something. But it hadn't been blown away. The man had taken it. He'd been here for weeks, living in this shelter, mere yards from my house. A chill ran through me as I realized this. Part of me felt bad for him with him being homeless, but that didn't mean he wasn't dangerous. I realized I hadn't locked the door when I left my house to go to the shelter. He could have gone there. I clutched the cat to me and stood up to grab my phone that I now realized I'd dropped during the struggle. I picked it up off the floor and flipped it over, delighted to see it was getting a signal. Not much of one, but it was something. I called my husband and stayed in the shelter until he came home. Thankfully, there were no strange people in our house, which was still in one piece. The tornado had hit nearby, but it was a bit south of us, and thankfully there wasn't much damage. It seemed no one had been hurt. There was no sign of the man, though. I think my neighbors should be locking the shelter from now on. I know I'll feel much less foolish when I triple-check my locks now. You never know who could be out there, just a few steps from your front yard. This happened during the summer of 2015. I had just graduated high school, and I still lived in my hometown at that time. I was out with some friends, and it was getting really late in the evening, around 1am or so. I decided it was around time to head home. First, though, I had to stop by a drugstore close to my house that was 24-7 to pick up some aspirin and snacks. The one I went to was in the same parking lot as a supermarket, which is important. I parked my car as close to the store as possible. It was quite empty, so there were no more than two other cars in this giant lot. I was nowhere near either of them. I headed in and grabbed what I came to get very quickly. 
I just had this overwhelming feeling of dread the whole time, for seemingly no reason. I felt like someone was constantly watching me, but when I looked around, I couldn't see anyone else there. Well, besides me and the cashier. After I had gotten everything I intended to buy, I stalled checking out for a bit. I went aisle by aisle, looking at random things. I thought, just in case, whoever was out there would surely get bored and leave if I took too long looking around. Really though, the whole time I thought I was just being paranoid. I wasn't used to going out so late, so surely that must be it. After about 20 minutes of that wandering around, I paid for my items and left the store. I got to the door and literally bolted to my car, pepper spray in hand. I locked myself in immediately. I turned my head to check the back seat. Just before, I was about to breathe a sigh of relief because no one really was there. I heard a sudden tapping on my window. I looked around before I'd left the store near the entrance, and I'd seen that no one was nearby, so how had I not seen whoever was tapping out there? Of course, this really freaked me out. I don't know if this person was Ted Bundy inspired or what, but this was quite an odd occurrence. I looked up to see a very handsome blonde man with slightly long hair and a big cast on his arm. My first instinct was to drive off immediately, but this man was leaning on the front hood part of my car. I didn't want to just run him over and get in trouble or something, so I rolled my window down just an inch. I called out to him and asked him to maybe back up just a bit so I could drive off without hitting him, but no, he stayed glued to my car. The man then asked me if I could help him with directions and to look up an address for him. Uh, I really need to go right now, sir. Maybe you can ask the person in the drugstore and they can help. I already went to the supermarket and they said they couldn't do anything. Well, that was a big mistake. I knew that place closed at exactly 8pm. There was no way this guy had just been lurking around for five whole hours, waiting for some random girl's help. He then went on and on about feeling really tired. If I could just give him some water or food I'd bought since he had no money, that would be a great help. I told him okay and began to reach to my passenger side to grab the chips I had bought. I started to roll the window down slightly, and like I expected, he moved closer to my window. It was all part of my plan though. Now he was off the hood of my car. I slammed on the gas. He chased my car as it started to pull out, and I heard a scraping sound on the side as I pulled away. I didn't drive directly home just in case I was followed. Instead, I drove down the highway for an hour. I was so distraught over what just happened. When I finally got home, the entire side of my car had been scraped from the door almost to the trunk. I'm pretty sure he used a knife or some other sharp object because it was a really rough scrape. Of course, I immediately reported the incident but they never found that man or heard of any similar incidents in my town. He was watching me the entire time, perhaps from the windows of the store. How else would he have known I'd brought food with me? I think maybe he had hidden behind my car so I couldn't see him when I came out at first. I feel like he was trying to get me before I got in my car, but I was too scared and happened to get in too fast for him to act. 